Welcome to today's webinar session. My name is Maureen Ochako. I'm the R2C program manager. Feel free to introduce yourself on the chat and we'll start in about a minute as we introduce ourselves. Karibu Nisana. I think we, as we continue introducing, I would like us to start the webinar session. So thank you very, very, very much for joining us today. Sorry about the delay, there was a technical hitch, but we are here now and we're very happy that you've been able to join us. As I mentioned before, my name is Maureen Ochako and I'll just take two minutes to tell you about the R2C program. Then we go up to the panel discussion for today. So we are running the R2C program which is a program with two main objectives. The first one being to really enable researchers commercialize their innovation. And the second objective being now strengthening institutions in their commercialization process. And we have two main cohorts. We have just concluded the first cohort that was made up of eight researchers. And we are currently excitedly onboarding the second cohort and we target, uh, we're targeting 12 innovators and the idea is that by December, we should have walked with them the commercialization journey, perhaps introduced them to a few commercial and industrial partners, as well as, you know, just having uh, hand, hand holding regarding specific coaching items that they have. And uh, yeah, so welcome to this webinar session. Our session today is tipping negotiations into your favor. And with me, I'm very honored to have two very uh, extremely qualified negotiators. I'd like to call them that. And I'll let them introduce themselves and then we'll start right on. So Karibuni Sana, uh, let's uh, get right into it. I'll allow uh, Dr. Kenny to introduce himself. Uh, thank you, Maureen. Thank you for everyone who's on this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Kenny Karanja. I'm a technology licensing officer at the University of Minnesota. I have I am a trained molecular biologist who did a lot of basic science uh, before transitioning from what I call a wet science to dry science. My current role is negotiating uh, agreements uh, for the University of Minnesota researchers and uh, working with them to transition their innovations, inventions, technologies uh, from the bench to the marketplace. Glad to share my uh, knowledge with everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tenny. We are happy that you were able to join us uh, today. And I think for our participants, you appreciate that normally we have the webinars in the morning, but we had to cater for Dr. Tenny's uh, time difference, and we are happy that you've been able to join us. Uh, over to you, Stephen Gugu. Um, thank you, um, Maureen, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, pleasure to meet uh, with the different people who are here. I've seen a couple of familiar names from some of the programs that we run, so it's good to see everyone who's been able to join. Uh, quick introduction about myself. Uh, I'll speak about my two hats. Uh, one is uh, I'm one of the uh, co-founders of Future Ventures, and we work very closely with entrepreneurs and support them from a capturing perspective. Uh, support them with uh, any negotiations that they might have uh, with uh, partners. I mean, I'm an angel investor, so we make a bit of investments to them and they support them through that journey when they want to raise the next round uh, and when they're looking to you know, do any partnerships. Uh, but I also am a transaction advisor. Um, so I've been, uh, I run a company called uh, Invest Africa and in Invest Africa, we do transaction advisory. And part of transaction advisory is negotiating uh, different deals. And I've been uh, fortunate to sit uh, on either side negotiating uh, on my own behalf, negotiating for entrepreneurs, negotiating on behalf of investors. So while I may not sort of like 
talk very specifically about the, the research commercialization bit, uh, I have one or two things to share about negotiations. I'm an uh, avid reader and I try to explore a lot uh, the topic of negotiations. So there's also a bit of uh, theoretical just underpinning some of the stuff I'm going to speak about. And most importantly, I have uh, four small daughters, uh, who, uh, which means that I'm always negotiating from morning till evening for different things. So I'll also come from that angle. Thank you. Yep. All right, thank you. Yeah, they say negotiation is in everyday activity. So it's a life skill that we all need to have. So there's a misconception that says, uh, well, while I was growing up, I used to think negotiation means you get a yes, right? But obviously that's a misconception uh, because I was just looking at uh, someone called Christopher Voss who says that successful negotiation is not about getting to yes, no. It's about mastering the no and understanding what the path to an agreement is. And I thought, mm, quite insightful. So just so that we're on the same uh, break, so, so that we're on the same understanding, maybe my first question would be, you know, what is negotiation and, and why is it important? And we can start with the father of three, three daughters, <laughs> four, four, four daughters. So what is negotiation and, and why is it important? Um, yeah, I, I mean, at the core, if you ask me what negotiation is, it's really just uh, when two parties or more are sitting together and they're trying to discuss or they're trying to allocate interest uh, on a topic that is important for them, right? So you're uh, talking about something that's important for you and you want to allocate different interests that uh, I'm going to take this piece, you're going to take a, a different piece uh, out of that. So at the core, that's just what negotiation is. And we're negotiating every single day. Uh, if you imagine it uh, moves all the way from, you know, your spouse, uh, you know, at times you're just negotiating in terms of some house chores, who's going to do something, right? So you have to figure out, I'm going to do this bit, you're going to do this bit. You're negotiating with your, I don't know, someone that you work with, uh, that uh, it's about how you work on a different, on a specific assignment, who's going to handle one bit. That's a very, very simple nego in, in, in negotiation. You're negotiating uh, with a potential financier. So, I mean, uh, at a very simple point, it's just that. You're sitting around the table, something that is of interest to both of you, and you're trying to then allocate interest in terms of what uh, you're going to take on the other person. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and maybe to Dr. Kenny, right. why is this skill important? Right. Uh, yeah, so that's a good point. And I like the, the examples you just gave that we negotiate every day because it is important for us to attain our goals and objectives and viewpoints. It's a, We are mutually coming to an agreement. So being able to effectively negotiate enhances a number of things. It enhances your ability to problem solve. It builds on relationships that you you already have or might have in the future because once you you get to a mutually agreeable uh, interest within your negotiations, you still will have to build on that relationship going forward. So you're expanding your network. It's also a means to you know influencing and uh, influencing your counterpart to see what value you offer and also to yourself to see what value the other person offers. I believe if we are all pretty good negotiators, uh, the world will become a better place. Thank you. I like the way you have both uh, clarified it. I mean, there's an element of problem solving. There's an element of mutually agreeable benefit. There's also an element of influence, right? To influence each other to become a better world, really. So maybe my, my, my next question, and maybe we can start with you, Dr. Kenny. How would you define a good negotiator or what are some of the elements that make one a good negotiator? I think the example Stephen gave, of, I'm also a father of two boys. So you, you have to be able to understand where the other person is coming from. So one element of a good negotiator is an active listener. You actually listen more than you talk. And it's, it's actually a good... Uh, rule of thumb that I normally use in my negotiations is essentially to let the other person negotiate their way into a deal, right? So you wanna be an active listener, you wanna ask open-ended questions and, and just think holistically as to what you're trying to achieve, having a win-win mentality. Sometimes a mistake we make is to think that negotiations are adversarial, uh, they, they really don't have to be. You have to have an open mind to, to be able to find ways of bridging the gaps between the, the negotiating parties. 
Thank you. Um, any addition, Stephen? Yeah. Uh, and maybe uh, allow me to start with the previous question that you asked uh, in terms of why is it an important skill? And I like how uh, Kenny finished with, if we all negotiated well, we'd have a better world, right? Because if you're not a good negotiator uh, and you end up then getting a raw deal, what it ends up doing most often, it builds resentment, right? right? Uh, or it ends up building, you know, uh, unsustainable deals that will just mm -hmm. not work. Right, uh, and, and so I like that point uh, quite a bit, and that's why it's such an important thing for you know everybody to build their skills because then you know when you're when you're sitting down, you're having a discussion around something, you're negotiating something. Uh, when, once you feel you have a good deal and you sign on it, then it's more sustainable and it helps for that deal then to stick for a much longer period. And there's no resentment uh, in this case, so it is a critical skill uh, from that perspective. <clears throat> in terms of who a good negotiator is, uh, you know, I thought about this question. I said it really depends because. As a negotiator, you need to ask yourself what hat you need to wear based on the kind of negotiation uh, you're going to be having. Um, I mean, uh, we all want to have negotiations where it's not adversarial. Uh, we're trying to build value uh, at the end of the day. Uh, but unfortunately, some negotiation positions that you'll get into will force you to a particular corner and where you'll have to really push to get uh, a good deal. Uh, I, what I like, uh, and I, I think you spoke about uh, a book that you read, one book I really like, and which speaks about this model of negotiation, is called uh, Negotiating Like Your Life Counts on It. Uh, and let's imagine sort of like a situation, uh, it's all about sort of like hostage situation. The hostage situation, you're really not trying to get a win-win uh, situation. It may look like a win-win, but really you're trying to save lives and so forth. So you're trying to almost get everything. If you ask uh, from that perspective, you're negotiating on behalf of the people who will be taken hostage and so forth. And so that's how I say that it depends on uh, the situation. Uh, but I would say, uh, you know, in one situation such as that, uh, it's someone who's able to really, uh, you know, work with the other party to get uh, their way uh, without necessarily then losing the life that you're speaking about in this case. Uh, at times, uh, as a good negotiator, it calls for you to give way, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Where you look at uh, sort of like certain clauses that you're negotiating with someone and you realize that you don't have to win everything because a negotiation is also about how you feel after the negotiation, how the other party mm -hmm. feels after the negotiation. And if they feel they've been taken advantage of, uh, then most probably it's gonna, uh, not going to uh, hold uh, for, for a very long time. And so at times you may be forced for you as a good negotiator to give in on certain aspects, just to make sure that uh, the other party feels that they've gotten something out of uh, the negotiation. Uh, but you know, the summary then of all that is, you still need to build this negotiation where everybody is getting something out of it and everybody feels invested in the final result that comes together. And so they're willing to take that forward and then you don't have a fracture that happens at some point. Right. Thank you. I think you bring a very uh, important point about ensuring that as you're negotiating, the other person is not necessarily feeling resentment at the end of the negotiations, which is a very critical point. And then I think one thing that I also liked, uh, and I'll, there's a, a previous panelist who also spoke about it, that you need to listen more in active listening. And he was reminding us that, you know, we have two ears so that we listen more and we only have one mouth, so we need to speak less. So I thought yeah. that was a good uh, good tip so Maybe as we to, to quickly yes, yes. on there uh, I, one, one thing i do as a negotiator is to so when i negotiate i don't look at deals as bad deals per se i look at a deal as the deal you negotiate so you have to be prepared to make those concessions so the the, the deal is the deal that you negotiate there is no good or bad deal but that is contextual of course there's only the deal that you negotiate so kids take away there are no bad deals. We just need to negotiate <laughs> uh, the deals in, in the right way, really. Right. And uh, yeah, maybe to just converse the con uh, progress the conversation, what are then some of the useful techniques that innovators, researchers uh, can use to, to tip the negotiations in their favor? And before you answer, maybe I can allow, uh, I can just notify that our attendants our participants, feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A session and we'll answer them as we proceed. Feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A session and we'll answer as we proceed. So yeah, back to our panelists. So we were talking about, we need to be good negotiators. We understand why it's important for us to be good negotiators, but how then are we, what are some of the tools and techniques that we can use to ensure that we are good negotiators? 
Uh, we can start with Dr. Kenny. Uh, yeah, one, one is really preparation. You, this cannot be minimized or gainsaid. You got to get yourself ready. So, and the preparation is two ways. You have to know what your value proposition is, what you're bringing to the table. You have to identify your interests. You have to identify what is really critical to you in terms of goals. You know, for us, we do have goals to meet certain goals. So you need to be prepared. And also on, the, on your counterpart, I, I don't call them opponents, on your counterpart, you need to know what they're looking for. If it is an industry or a company, you need to know what their pain points are. Uh, admittedly, you may not know all that because companies don't always divulge what their critical issues are, but you need to do your background and understand where they are coming from so that you can position your interests accordingly. Another thing I do is using some uh, negotiation tactics like uh, framing and, and uh, anchoring. So for example, when you are in a negotiation, uh, position yourself positively. I give an example of, I, I do a lot of pharmaceutical deals and every drug has, uh, 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 what are they called? Side effects, right? And the side effect can be, you know, 5% of the people die from taking this medication. When you're negotiating, you don't want to say 5% of patients will die, right? You want to say 95% of the patients will survive. So the way you frame your negotiation and also using we, instead of you, you do this, I do that. How about we? How can we accomplish this together? Uh, and anchoring is one interesting one that uh, there's a lot of uh, literature and conversations around it is who goes first in a deal? How do you, if you are the one in a negotiating position, if you're the seller or the buyer, who goes first? Who gives the term sheet first? So for me, what I normally do is if I know the value that I want, I will go first. If I don't know the value of my asset because that happens, I let the other, my counterpart go first. The reason is that the number you give the, at the end of that negotiation, you will be pretty close to whatever number that was offered first. So if you know your value, go fast. You can go high and hopefully, but then that's where the uh, preparation comes in. You don't want to be too high that your counterpart <laughs> walks away. And then the last one is uh, what I call tradables. And uh, Stephen mentioned earlier, exchange of value, you know, give the other, uh, your counterpart something that may not be necessarily of value to you, but is of value to them. So those are some of the tactics that I, I, I use when negotiating. Okay, thank you. And we'll, I'll come back with a follow-up question, but allow me to also uh, hear from Steven. What are some of the techniques that you use and have been very useful for you as you're negotiating? Yeah, I, I think uh, Kenny has mentioned a number of them, and I really like the idea of uh, prepare, 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 right? Uh, because a negotiation is often won. I'm using the word won, but uh, you, you you often get the best deal based on the amount of preparation you put into it, right? And it's a different aspect that uh, you know is spoken about. <laughs> but I would say just a few more things that uh, would be useful is you know create rapport. Right? Uh, when people feel good, when people in a good mood, they are more likely to, you know, uh, have a better negotiation with you than in a situation where it's antagonistic. And so just the idea of just, you know, understanding who's coming to negotiate, what's their background, uh, you know, what are they interested in, um, and just making sure that, you know, you start from a good space. You know, I've been in situations where people start from a very bad space where then people take very hard positions, and then it becomes very hard to move them uh, even an inch. Uh, because there's, uh, there's almost a certain level of mistrust where people are assuming that, you know, you're trying to take advantage of me and so I have to cover myself as much as possible, right? So I would say just that idea of creating rapport in terms of understanding who's there, you know, spending a bit of time just getting to know people before you get to the actual nitty gritty of what you're going to be negotiating. Such an important uh, point. <clears throat> there are sort of like, uh, I know it's a technique, but this whole idea of leaving room uh, to make concessions. Right. So when you walk into a negotiation, the idea is that you don't come in and give your final offer on the first day. Right. right? Uh, and I always say that negotiation is like dating. You know, you don't come uh, to your partner and say, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want. You sort of like uh, move towards that over a period of time through different sessions uh, from, a uh, from a conversation perspective. And mm -hmm. so you want to make sure that uh, you, you know what you want, uh, which is maybe in this case, it's your, um, you know, the, 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 what you're looking for then, but you, you also have a, 
uh, a best case scenario that you know if this could happen then i'd be happy with it which then gives you a certain room for coming back and making concessions if concessions then are needed uh, in this case and often they're needed um, on the point of uh, research uh, and sort of like preparing yourself it's also good to think about what are the authoritative standards right so for instance if you're negotiating with your institution for argument's sake uh, it would be good to ask what have other institutions done because just coming in and saying that this is a kind of negotiation i'm happy with a certain uh, you know corporate out there uh, you're looking for some uh, specific deal it's good to ask have they done previous deals uh, of this kind of nature what did they agree in those deals do you know other corporates have done something similar because then you have authoritative standards so you have something that you can if someone is pushing back and say we know for sure that this is workable because you've been done in this situation and this situation and this situation because just asking for things in a negotiation is not enough you have to uh, be able to back those things with uh, research and with facts in terms of uh, what's out there so maybe that's uh, some additional aspects but i would say you know the core one is just uh, prepare gather as much information uh, information is the currency for any negotiation mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think I'm hearing, you know, a lot of techniques that we can use. You know, there was a conversation about how you frame your value proposition, so to speak. Do you say 95% or do you say 5%? Then there was also the conversation about anchoring, which I want to follow on. Uh, I think that's the example you were saying that uh, if, uh, I think it was Dr. Kenny who was saying that if I know my value, then I'm, you know, I'm very outright with it. But when I'm not uh, sure of my value, then I, you know, somewhat dilly dally. Um, is has there been instances, for example, where, you know, you thought your value was C, but in essence, your value was A, at least according to the other person. And how did you manage that? Yeah, that that's a good question. I always approach that as whatever you're offering is as good as the, your counterpart is willing to pay for, right? <laughs> yeah. If you overvalue your asset, then you might not get your a buyer. If you undervalue, then you will end up with a bad deal. But remember, it's a deal that you negotiated. So it's a number of points that Stephen made, uh, like knowing what the industry standard is for whatever asset you're trying to negotiate. Right, because they, they are certain bounds, there are certain uh, parameters over time. So those are like market-based valuation, knowing what the value of your asset is. So you don't go too high and you also don't go too low. And the communication bit is also important because it's the, the number that you quote may not be necessarily the main thing that is of interest. You could be going for, say, as a researcher, for example, you could be going for sponsored research. Maybe you want uh, a company to sponsor research in your lab. So just going for that plain value may not be the key. You can ask for other things. And that's why we talk about tradable or concessions. Don't go with, 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 uh, with a position, right? That you really can't move from that position. You want to go in with interests. And how do those interests get addressed by whatever uh, anchoring uh, opportunity that you have? Thank you. And I think you all, I would also marry with what Stephen was saying that, you know, he's been to negotiations where people have come, you know, ready. Both parties are, you know, fists are ready to, to negotiate. I don't know if that's really a negotiation or it's a, yeah, it's a different uh, conversation. So I think that was also very good. And I think also uh, Stephen talked about uh, creating rapport. And I think that's just the value of networking and just becoming friends even before you get to that point of negotiation, whether it's friends or acquaintance, but just creating that rapport. I thought that was also pretty useful. And then I think you also talked about the element of benchmarking. You know, if you're not sure, just find out what the market is or what other people within the, with, with the same context are actually doing. Yeah. So thank you for that. Thank you. I think now I'm the worried, next just question... To... I just want just yes, to yes. add uh, one aspect uh, to the question that you asked where you come in and you know what you're proposing for is very different from the other uh, party and i think for me i always say have a rationale or that as to why you're sort of like asking for something so let's assume it's a valuation right so if it's a valuation you've checked what um, and here i'll speak about a typical transaction you've uh, thought about what are the multiples that are employed in that uh, sector that you're in? Maybe it's a multiple of sales, assuming there's some sales which are happening, a multiple of uh, the EBITDA or the profit and so forth, right? And you've done your own research to see what's the source of that. And so when you walk into a negotiation, you will have a multiple that will say, I'm thinking about a multiple of 10 times the EBITDA for argument's sake, or five times the sales for argument's sake. 
And so when someone comes and you sort of, assuming the sales were 1,000, five times 1,000 is 5,000, and the person comes and tells you that the expectation is 1,000, rather than having a conversation about, no, it should be 2,000, it should be this amount, then the issue, you should ask, you know, what's the rationale? You know, how did you arrive at this price? And then you're not uh, necessarily arguing on positions, but you're trying to understand where someone is coming from. And you might find that you're coming from very different positions. And maybe the thing you need to, uh, to, to be addressing in this case is where someone is coming from rather than what the, the final position that someone is at. So just having a clear rationale as to why you arrived at a particular position is usually very useful because then you can have a more intellectual or more value-based conversation once you sit down across the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think that was a very useful tip. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, again, maybe uh, to use Steven just to progress the conversation. So as a researcher, how would you, as a researcher or an innovator, how are you able to identify and leverage your strengths when you're now having commercialization negotiations? So now we are, you know, focusing on now research or innovators. So how would a researcher uh, be able to leverage their strengths in their conversation regarding commercialization negotiations? Yeah, uh, thanks for that. And I guess there's two, there's two angles here, and I'll speak from our own context, first of all. And our context is that uh, probably the first negotiation as a researcher that you need to do is with your institution. So probably like agree in terms of you know what kind of stake are you gonna get out of you know licensing in this case what's go what are gonna be the fees and so forth and whatever the licensing agreement looks like uh, that's the first step before then you even uh, go outside and I would say that, uh, that for for, uh, for for our researchers who are within different institutions I think the first fight has to be in terms of how the the, the policy from an institution uh, looks like uh, because if you have a good policy that uh, is very clear in terms of uh, how the numbers look like, then it makes your work very easy because you know uh, what are the bounds uh, that you're able to negotiate in between. But if that is not there, if that's not structured well, that already hampers you in terms of just the step one of that uh, kind of negotiation, right? So for me, I think the first thing is make sure that the policies that uh, are being uh, put together, uh, you know, are fair or uh, reflect uh, the reality in terms of what should be happening, um, you know, internationally and uh, locally in this case. So I, I think for me, that's the first thing. Uh, but when you're going into the market, uh, I think the one thing that uh, I would want to speak about, how do you leverage your strengths, is that number one, have your ducks in a row. You know, uh, if you've already uh, put together, you know, your IP documentation is very clear. Uh, you've already sort of like, um, you know, uh, the incorporation from, uh, if it's an organization, you've already incorporated it and so forth. Some of those small things help a lot in terms of just uh, making sure that the negotiation then runs smoothly. Because you don't have a small things that people can start saying, you know, but you haven't done it, but you haven't done it, but you haven't done this, right? That's one. Uh, and I would say the second thing is, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, is traction. Yeah. Uh, I find that uh, when you're starting out and you don't have as much uh, traction in your, whatever your innovation is and what you're trying to, like, to negotiate with a corporate on the other side, whether it's a partnership, uh, whether, and I'll use some of the examples that at least uh, that I have encountered, where we've had startups that go to Safari for, for argument's sake, and they want to negotiate uh, you know, a ref share for a particular thing where they want to access Safari from users and they're going to have a ref share with Safari from in this case. Now, if you come and you have proper traction uh, and you tell Safari from that's where you have this number of users who are coming on board uh, and this is our product, uh, this is how, you know, the competitive advantage from a product perspective is to see, then you'll have a different conversation from when you're coming and tell Safari from, you know, we want to access only your users, we don't have as much traction, and there's a couple of issues. Right, so just building on your traction uh, helps a lot in terms of giving you more leverage uh, when you're having that kind of uh, negotiation. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, the other one I would say is the research bit, but uh, I think for me the biggest thing is uh, you know that that uh, traction helps a lot to have that kind of conversation. Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kenny. Yeah, uh, good good points. And as a researcher, you I, I look at these two ways, and it fits to Stephen's point that. The two things you're looking at is your own personal capacity to negotiate. If you really are not familiar with this field, uh, please seek help. Go to people like uh, Steven who have transactional uh, experience. Find someone who can negotiate on your behalf. But then on the other hand, if you want to do it yourself, then uh, hopefully this webinar gives you some uh, capacity to do that or, or some experience and, and, and points the way to doing that. 
The other part is valuing your own asset that you bring to the table. What's the value proposition? What's the traction for that? Have you done some customer development? Do you think that this is a, a technology that can solve a problem or it's a technology that is seeking a problem, right? You want to be able to frame what you're offering in, in a way that your counterpart can visualize that thing solving their problem. And that is where you have the value exchange. An example I often give uh, to researchers, you, you know, you can uh, sell an elephant for a penny, right? And I might have the penny, but I have no need for the elephant. So make sure whatever you're offering is packaged right and effectively, effectively communicate that value to your negotiating counterpart. The other thing that comes to mind is uh, job interviews. They always ask you, what is your weakness? And a lot of people, you know, they meander about weaknesses. They don't want to say what it is. So when you're evaluating your, your uh, technology towards uh, commercialization and negotiation, you want to have a partner. Partner is, is essentially your weakness. What's the best alternative to a negotiating, uh, a, to a negotiated agreement? And that allows you to walk away. If you can't get anything better than your partner, then you may as well get take your partner and walk away, right? And at the same time, you want to have what is called a zone of potential agreement. What's the range of opportunities and numbers are you okay with while making uh, a deal? So going into a negotiation with those, I, I believe it sets you up to, to negotiate that deal <laughs> that you negotiated, right? And, and you walk away not feeling uh, uh, unfairly, but unfairly uh, taken advantage of. But on the other hand, we, have, we are communicating with people. So emotional intelligence is critical. You want to have a high EQ going into these conversations. And they are not personal. It is really not personal. I know there is emotion in it. I know it's your research baby, but you, be uh, cognizant of the fact that the, your counterpart may not understand where you're coming from. So you, you need to have that conversation. Yeah, thank you. I like uh, the illustration you're talking about. I may sell an elephant for a penny, but if you have no need for a, an elephant, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. So I think both of you are bringing out very good points. And then I think there was also a conversation of, about seeking help, about you know understanding your research research innovation and knowing how to value it, having a range, ensuring that there's a bit of traction, you know, competitive advantage. And then I think also the, again back to the conversation about you know rapport before you get to the point of negotiations. So what I'm wondering is, as an innovator, as a researcher, how am I then building? How do I build this rapport? Obviously, it's over time, but what are some of the things that I can do to build my rapport with my commercial, potential commercial partners, potential investors, potential financiers? Uh, shall we start uh, with uh, you, Dr. Kenny? Uh, sure. Yeah, a lot of that is really making connections and networking. Uh, and one thing I always say is you are negotiating at any time. At the beginning of this conversation, we said you, you are a father, you negotiate. You're a wife, you negotiate. You're a teacher, you negotiate. You're a customer, you negotiate. Anytime you're having these interactions in your day-to-day -day, uh, activities, you want to be cognizant of that fact. Listen to what the other party is. And, and, and in this context, uh, I'm looking at it not when you're already in a negotiation, but prior to getting to a negotiation. So build those relationships, understand what your market is, uh, be attuned to the problems that are around you. And, and part of that is those conversations, you can tailor them to understand the, the interests. So, in the, so for us in, in academic research, there's a lot of uh, generating new knowledge without really looking at the outside world and what that outside world looks like. So part of making those interactions in your daily activities would help you because as we are talking about value proposition, you will use that information to craft and message whatever you're trying to, to get a deal around. Thank you. So I can see Stephen is nodded. Would you like to add? Yeah, maybe what I would add, and I'll borrow just from uh, fundraising, right? Uh, what, you, what you want to do is you want to ensure, by the time you're coming to the table, people know you 
they know about what you're speaking about and they form the, the, the opinion you want them to, uh, to form, right? The opinion you want them to form about what you're doing. So if, you're, you know, if your product is solving a specific problem and it's a market leading product and so forth, if you're able to just get to a point where there's some information out there, maybe there's a blog that you'll be maintaining, there's some updates that you'll be sharing with, uh, in, uh, with potential uh, partners in this case, uh, where they're able to just tell this is the traction that you've been able to make or this way you are. That helps a lot in terms of just building that, that trap one back to the point that uh, Dr. Henry mentioned about anchoring. But then people view in a particular point. So that when you come and ask for certain things, they already are in that frame of mind uh, where they're more, they're in a position where they can hear you better, they can uh, give you what you're looking for uh, in this case. The other thing that I think is really important is asking who introduces you to the party that you're going to uh, sit with on the other side, right? And one of the things you hear very often from uh, at least investors in this case is that the person who introduces you really matters. If someone calls me and it's a fellow angel investor, it's a piece that I really respect, tells me, you know, uh, Dr. Kendi is doing this thing, you have to invest in that, it's really awesome, uh, just listen to him. Or, you know, Maureen is a really good founder, please listen to her, she's doing some really cool stuff. That by itself sets the frame in terms of how we're going to have the conversation. But if I can get a cold email, I don't know who you are, where you come from, and you know we don't have any rapport and so forth. I just get a cold email. You know, you're a 50-50, right? Uh, if you're sort of like thinking about it, but when there's a warm introduction that you're 90% or 70% already in, and you just have to prove the other 30%. So I think uh, also just uh, asking yourself when you're getting into negotiation, who's bringing you to the table? Who do you know who can uh, you know create the context for you? So that as you're sitting across the table, people already have a certain perception of you that helps to move the negotiation forward. I think that has been a very eye-opening statement for me as well. I mean, when you go to a networking event, you don't necessarily think who's going to introduce me because that then creates perception. So I like that, uh, Stephen, you've brought that up. And I think even as an innovator, as a researcher, when you're going for a networking event or when you're going to just meet with potential financiers, we need to be very conscious about the perception created even before we start the negotiation. I think that has been a very useful tip for me uh, as a moderator even. And, and maybe to just, uh, again, continue the conversation. So how, uh, I think one of you mentioned uh, understanding the other person's pain point and knowing how to negotiate or, or present your value with the language that they, they need to hear, right? So my question to Stephen would be, I'm an innovator. I understand my goals are here. My goals are A, B, C, D, but then the financial commercial partners' goals are a bit different. How do I sort of marry marry the two goals to ensure that we are speaking this, the same language? And maybe before you answer, just again, a reminder to the participants, feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A session. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Stephen Google. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I think what you want to do is to, okay, number one, just do your research in the sense of spend time on the website, spend time on the Twitter pages, the LinkedIn pages, and see what the company is talking about. If they have a vision, if they are, it's a listed company, they have an annual report that they speak about what are the some of the things, what are their vision, where they're, where they're trying to go and so forth, right? And that may seem very perfect, but you pick out certain uh, things in terms of the values of the company, the vision, what they're trying to achieve, uh, that you can be able to, uh, you know, marry it with what you're trying to do, right? If not, uh, you know, LinkedIn is a very useful tool, right? For reaching out uh, to people in, in different institutions or, you know, asking someone for introduction and sitting down with people before you go into the negotiation and asking, you know, what, we, we have this product, Right? And I'll go back to sort of like the conversation I was having about uh, Safari Command. And we've also had uh, some other conversations with other uh, corporates. Uh, and the whole idea here is you're sitting with someone and you're saying, I have this thing, and I know you guys are interested in this space. What angles are you guys looking at uh, in this case? Right? Uh, we were working with a large uh, media company that was interested in making deals with uh, different uh, startups in the media sector. And the, the most important thing here was then to understand from the media company's perspective, what uh, what value chains are they interested in? Because you know, media is huge, but what value chains are they interested in? What kind of deals do they want to strike uh, when they're sort of like engaging with different uh, startups in this case? And having that kind of information from an insider, and usually, you know, we say that we have the six degrees of separation, but I think nowadays they've, re they've reduced quite significantly. You can find this two, three degrees uh, separation. You can sit with someone who can give you really good background um, to be able to uh, then have this kind of conversation. The other thing you could do is just check, you know, what other 
uh, you know, kind of deals has the, the, the corporate that you're looking to engage with uh, done uh, in this case. And there's this uh, camaraderie that exists between entrepreneurs, where if you write to another entrepreneur and tell them, hey, we are supposed to have this kind of conversation with this organization, I know you've struck a deal with them, could we chat? I just want to hear how your experience has been. Most people will, uh, you know, uh, organize at least a 30 minute chat or whatever it is just to share some ideas with you. So those are some things that you can do practical uh, in terms of uh, being able to marry what you're looking at and what the institution is looking at. Thank you. I'm seeing, uh, yeah, you're smiling in agreement. So Dr. Kenny, right. same question. Yeah, I think those are excellent points. I like the last one too, because we do that all the time. If I have a deal that I'm about to do and I really don't know how to frame these or to structure, I send an email, <laughs> six degrees of separation, right? It's actually three or even two WhatsApp group, a lot of chit chat, LinkedIn conferences. And I agree. Sometimes you may not get the details of the deal itself because those are confidential terms often, but they will give you an outline of what kind of arrangement they had with whatever license they were doing. The other thing I always say is you don't have to do a deal. When you get into these negotiations, you don't, the, the best deal might be the one you don't do. So always have that at the back of your mind that you don't have, if the deal just doesn't meet your parameters, just walk away, look for some, there are very many fish in the sea, so they say, right? So the best deal could be walking away. But you have to know where you're walking away. You have to have your partner. You have to have your ducks in a row, as we said. You have to have prepared. Don't walk away from a deal you could have had, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just sometimes there's also the element of fear. You know, like if I miss out on this deal, when am I going to have another conversation uh, regarding the same? So how do you then tackle that? How do you balance the fear? And, and you know, this is the value that I want. And any of you is, uh, can respond. I think I'll just put a one line and then I'm sure Kenny might have a bit more context. Uh, I, I said that a bad deal is worse uh, at times than a no deal. Because mm -hmm. right? uh, at times when you have the wrong partners on board, in fact, uh, there is this quote I like using a lot. It's uh, from a book called The Founder's Dilemma by a professor, I think, in one of the Ivy League schools called Noam Wasserman. And he says, uh, if uh, startups were battlefields, uh, most of, of the casualties would result from friendly fire than from enemy fire. Right. And, <laughs> and what it means is really when you have the wrong partners in your board, yeah. when you have the wrong partners in your, you know, as, as shareholders or as key partners in your organization, that can do you in faster than when you don't have any money and you're looking for a partner that you're going to work with. Because you have the first stress, which is just trying to sort out this specific uh, party here. Uh, but out there, the competitors are, are still sort of like, you know, there's a competitive market, right? So people are still pushing to sort of claim your market share to, you know, on different aspects. And you don't want to be fighting internally. You want to be, you know, looking outside and asking, how can we conquer markets? Not uh, having internal conversation, which slows you down uh, so much. So I'll go back to what uh, Kenny said that, I think the best deals are the ones you don't do. Right. Yeah. Okay. Oftentimes, the, these deals don't die because of money or the numbers or the technology. They die because of the people. So if the people in front of you don't pass the smell tests, don't spray perfume on them. It, it just it's not going to work. <laughs> okay. All right. It's a good, uh, yeah, it's a good way to put it. Uh, maybe we can now, I mean, and that's one of some of the mistakes maybe that we do make as research or innovators. So maybe what are some of the other, apart from not passing the smell test, what are some of the other mistakes uh, that innovators make when they're doing deals, when they're negotiating? Uh, Kenny? Yeah, uh, one thing I always say, never negotiate with yourself. If your negotiation comes to a point where you are the one giving concession after concession, it's time to walk away. That's just the bottom line. Just say thank you. Thank you for meeting you. Have a good day and just walk. Don't negotiate with yourself. For every concession that you give, try to get, and here get doesn't mean you are enforcing a position. You are getting something of, your, of interest to you. It's not that you must get. So every concession, try to get something. So the way I frame this is if I'm negotiating uh, an agreement, I say, you know, if you do this, then we will do that. And I use we because it's a team. I don't want it to be like it's about me personally. 
it's we. Make sure you, you, you kind of contextualize that as, uh, as a win-win, so to speak. So, so failure to have a button, a best alternative to a negotiated agreement, always have a point where you will walk away. It is not personal, right? The, the price, the, the money is good, it's attractive, but it is not always the thing that kills a deal as I mentioned previously. Always contextualize and understand what you want when you go into a negotiation. So those are the main ones that I always, the negotiating against yourself is a main one. Sometimes that one sneaks up on us, especially when your negotiating counterpart is doing piecemeal uh, concessions. They, they ask for this and then two days later, they ask for something else. No, that's, you will end up negotiating yourself. Negotiate the entire package, hence the preparation. You know what you want. You have an idea of what your counterpart wants and have that whole thing as one deal. Don't nitpick. And once you've agreed to that this is it, we are done, then the, that's it. It's done. Don't come a week later and ask for something else or the other person asking for something else. That's the territory you're getting into negotiating against yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Stephen, I know you've worked with very many innovators. What do you feel are some of the mistakes they make when it comes to negotiating for the innovations? Yeah, so, so I'll start with, uh, with some generic ones. Uh, I think number one is just learn to use silence and learn to yeah. close your mouth. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know how to put it down. Uh, you know, at times, uh, most of us are not comfortable with silence. You know, when you walk in and you made a certain demand and the other party keeps quiet or, you know, they take too much to respond and you feel as though, you know, you want to then give a further concern and say, okay, but maybe we could also do this, you know, mm -hmm. learn to put a position and then just wait for the other party to respond. Uh, so that then, you know, you know, the concessions are also moving from one side to the other. It's not just you uh, making concessions uh, in this case. But for that, my top two um, would be, number one, assuming that all negotiations are the same and all negotiators you're sitting with are all interested in this value-based uh, kind of negotiation where you win and I win, right? Of course, we, we all want that negotiation and it's the best kind of negotiation. But every so often you come across negotiators uh, who or the only thing they're interested in is just getting the best possible deals. And so if you walk in there with that assumption that this person also means well and so forth, and you have to then be a very good judge of character and to really understand who you're negotiating on the other side, you can end up uh, you know, in a situation where you get a very raw deal. So you, know, you need to be aware in a negotiation and you know, try to understand the person, research the person you're going to be negotiating with, what's their background. You know, if you know people who can explain to you where they come from, whether if they've negotiated with them before, those kind of things, they help you a lot so that you can frame yourself as you're walking to these uh, negotiations. And, you know, I mentioned a couple of uh, interesting uh, books. One of the other <laughs> books that I think is uh, interesting from this whole space of is called Difficult Conversations. Right? Uh, and, and that book, uh, again, it's uh, to this point that even when you're sitting across, it's good to ask yourself, okay, you know, what's the end goal? What are we trying to achieve at the end of the day? Uh, what is success uh, for all of us? Because at times we don't think about that. We get sidetracked by small things. Uh, which are happening in the course of the negotiation. We don't have to ask ourselves, what's the final deal? What's success to us? You know, it's good to define that very clearly. So that even as you're moving along, the small things that you may not like that you can do with uh, as you move towards then uh, these uh, end goals. I think the other, the other one I'm going to throw in here is called, uh, I don't know, is not relying on experts. You know, one thing I ask uh, entrepreneurs or innovators is how many deals do you think you're going to negotiate in your life, right, of this kind of nature? And most often it's one or two or three at most. Then the other party that sits on the other side does this on a day-to-day -day basis. That's their bread and butter. So I ask them, who do you think has an upper hand in this negotiation, <laughs> right? And most often the person who's perfected the art of negotiation, even if you've gone for classes and so forth, they, they understand this space really well. So at times it may be time for you to just say, you know what, uh, let me go in with an expert. Let me sit with an expert who's going to be able to frame things. Because most often you, you might think that uh, you've got, in fact, I'll use a specific example. The, the founder of one of the companies in Kenya called Pesapan. You always joke that uh, some of the deals that he negotiated very early were not really good deals. And if he looks at the value of the company today, and let's assume a professor file is worth 100 million uh, for argument's sake, right? And he could have gotten an extra 5% uh, equity, but he didn't because he, did, he chose not to use a negotiator. 5% of 100 million uh, would be uh, 5 million both, right? 
Uh, but maybe the negotiator would have just costed it uh, a small amount of cash in this case. So I think you don't realize how the small negotiations that you're making today are going to affect the final output five years, 10 years uh, from today. When you're looking at the deal and you're looking at where you're at and ask yourself, was it worth to save this amount of cash um, or should I have just gotten an expert? So mm -hmm. I, I think those are the two outputs. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, thank you very much. And I'm seeing the time is really running after us, so chasing us. So I'll just uh, go to the last question. And then uh, if there's any question from the participants, then we'll be able to respond to it. Uh, but now the last question, as you give also your parting shots, would be how, do, what's the differentiating factor when you're negotiating with a very big farm, the Safari Coms ETC, versus a small, uh, a smaller uh, farm? What are some of the things that you can to do and don't do for, or what's the difference really between negotiating with a big farm as well as a small farm? Uh, Stephen? Um, I think the first thing is that, uh, of course, uh, the processes are very different in big organizations, and it's good to understand what's a process. You know, uh, you know, do they have a, a, I don't know, a, a committee that sits to approve? Before that, how many more steps do you, do you need to go through? So it's good to understand that process uh, because with a smaller, so like uh, I guess, a farm in this case or partner, uh, you probably just end up meeting with the core principal on the other side if you have a negotiation and you pair that down. So it's good to understand uh, that uh, process and because that will help in terms of knowing. Uh, you know, how to frame things and at what point the, ne the negotiation will be closed and who's the final uh, decision maker. Then I, I, I think that big corporates are also very interested in terms of your corporate governance and, you know, how whether your house is in order. Uh, over and above whether or not whatever you're negotiating on makes sense, then want to understand there's no tax liabilities, you know, you have certain standards that you're sort of like uh, abiding to, you, you know, you have certain policies you put in place. So they expect you to have a, a, your house in order in this case. So when you negotiate with them, they need to think about uh, those aspects. But the one last point I'm going to make, and uh, then I'll pass it uh, to Kenny, is even when you're trying to negotiate with these uh, organizations, remember uh, always that companies are not uh, uh, sold, companies are bought, right? And I like using this phrase a lot, and it's just to say that if you've built a really good thing and you've spoken about it and people know about it, uh, when you're getting to a negotiation, it doesn't matter whether it's a big party or it's a small party, when they come sit with you, they know what you have, and that's why they're coming to talk to you. But when you're the one who's always sort of like on the other side of your pushing, you might find that it's a much more difficult negotiation to have. So just remember that uh, companies are not sold, companies are bought, so to say. Anyway, uh, over to you, Kenny. Thank you very much. Uh, good points there. So yeah, uh, I'd say two things, expectation management. So uh, as Stephen mentioned, the big corporates, you, you might be negotiating with a committee, right? Not an individual. So you want to set your expectations right. Also, the large corporates are very risk averse. So depending on the nature of your asset that you're trying to license or negotiate over, the, the larger corporates are a lot less risk averse. They don't want to take a huge risk on bringing your technology to market, whereas small entities might be more risk tolerant because just by virtue of what they are, they can, uh, they can change their business model at a whim and accommodate your asset if that's what is needed to commercialize it. And also the, the unequal power dynamics. As an uh, innovator, maybe you, you just yourself, you don't have a company behind you. There's a huge power disparity. So when you go into these kinds of uh, negotiations, to Stephen's point, use experts, ask for help. Because that unequal dynamic is the one that leads you to do a, a, what I would call a bad deal or a, or a deal you should not have done. So having those things at the back of your mind will help you address how you position yourself and also how you prepare. You may need, uh, you know, a transactional attorney on your side. So some and and from an experiential perspective, we find it a lot easier to do deals with smaller companies just because you might be talking with the person who will actually sign off on the deal versus a large company that has to go for legal review, CEO, VP, and so on. So that's, that's we, uh, at my institution rather, we, we like doing deal with small corporates, nothing against the large ones, but we prefer the small ones. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you so much for your thoughts. Maybe I'll just give you 30 seconds each to give your closing remark, and then I'll just go through a few of the key points, many key points that I have here, and then we can close. Uh, shall we start with you, Kenny, your parting shots? 
Sure, my parting shot is don't, do not be afraid. Uh, let fear be your friend, right? Seek that opportunity that you're most afraid of, but do your homework, prepare and understand what you have. Whatever asset you have is valuable at least to you. So your challenge is to see if it is valuable to somebody, to someone else. Also, when you, you enter into negotiations, don't do positions, do interest. So make sure you know what your interest is and accommodate uh, your, your counterpart. Seek help. And, uh, and I think it's a lot of fun. I have to admit, you, you, you get, it's a conversation. So if you like people, be ready. Oh, and the final one, emotional uh, intelligence. Don't be upset. Don't make it personal. Have everything in context. You're alive. Okay. <laughs> You're alive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think over to you, Stephen. Yeah. So for me, two things and very much uh, in summary. Uh, number one, make sure you speak to multiple parties. Uh, don't just go with the first option that you get or don't have only one option as you go into a negotiation. It helps a lot when you've been talking to different parties and the conversations are going on. Uh, and that's the point around partner where you know that if this doesn't work, I have a couple of others. And just knowing that at times helps you to put your uh, position much uh, better. And then the second one is negotiation is a skill that you can improve on, right? Uh, and all you have to do is just be deliberate in terms of, uh, you know, putting yourself out there to negotiate different aspects. Uh, and I remember from uh, my business school uh, days, so like uh, 15 years back, uh, one of the key things my professor kept saying is that after every negotiation, sit back and ask yourself what worked well, what didn't work well. Uh, and then improve on the things that didn't work well. And just by doing that continuously and learning a bit more the different uh, texts that we're talking about helps you a lot to improve and then you become a, meta, a much better negotiation. As well. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Stephen and uh, Dr. Kenny, for joining us. Just through some points that I have covered, uh, that I have written down based on the di amazing discussions we have had. Of course, we defined who a negotiator is. But when you were talking about you know, what are some of the techniques, what are some of the do's and don'ts, I think what came out was you need to first prepare. You need to do your thorough research on what your value proposition is, but also understanding the other partner, the other person's pain points and being able to speak that language, identify your interest and your position. I think there was also a conversation about um, you know, some of the techniques that were highlighted. Then there was the element of framing, then there was anchoring, then there was tradables. And then just having a room for concession as you're negotiating. And then I think uh, Stephen also talked about uh, creating a rapport, and this is an ongoing experience. Keep on creating a rapport. And even as you're going to that networking event, remember who introduces you matters because then that the influence, the perception of people have you know, about you. And then also there was an element of you know, be an active listener, talk less, ask open-ended questions, and importantly, also, I think both of you have again mentioned that you need to seek for technical expert, technical help to help you through your negotiation. You need to have your value proposition very well. And even as you're negotiating, I think this, this came up from the mistakes. Be comfortable with silence, you know, just give your ask and then it's okay to be silent for a few seconds. And then there was also a, um, a discussion about don't negotiate with yourself and then nego negotiate as a piecemeal, or not as a piecemeal, but rather as a whole. And last but not least, uh, there was also uh, the expectations management. And I think uh, I would like to pause there. It's already four minutes past the hour, but thank you all very, very much. And maybe we can just appreciate our panelists for today's session. We can clap or just uh, give a reaction. Uh, for them taking their time to join us for this session. Those are very, yeah, just that you can't hear them, but I think our panelists, are, our participants are very happy that you've been able to share your knowledge, you've been able to join us. Uh, thank you very, very much. We hope to see you all next month. We have another, we actually have a webinar on the 29th of June. This is about uh, financing for your innovation and another webinar next month. Hope to see you all on the 29th of June from 11 to 12 hours East African time. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Have a lovely day, uh, Dr. Kenny. Thank you all. And from me, it is bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've typed some books there just in case uh, the books I was uh, mentioning, uh, which might be interesting for anyone. Thank you very much. And thank you, Maureen, for the expert moderation. Yes, that was <laughs> thank good. You. Thank you.
All right. Have a good day. Good afternoon. Good evening. Bye-bye.